and happy Sabbath, everyone. We'd like to praise God and thank him for bringing us here through another week so that we can come together and worship his name. As we begin today's Sabbath school service, I ask that we all stand with hymnals in hand as we turn to our opening song, which is number 221. Number 221, Rejoice, the Lord is King.
Luis Chavez. Abisada. Um, I'm reading poem. Um, poem 57, um, verse 9 and 10. It says, I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing up to thee among the nation. For thy mercy is great up to the heavens and thy truth up to the clouds. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. Good morning. It is now time for prayer. Please kneel if you can. Dear, merciful, heavenly Father, we come to you with much, with much gratitude and thanksgiving. Lord, you have watched over us throughout this week. Lord, you know what trials and circumstances that we may face throughout this week, but we know that you have given us this holy day, this Sabbath day, that you may touch our hearts and touch our minds and cleanse our souls, Lord. We ask for cleansing, Lord. We need your cleansing. Please allow us to be guided by your light. Allow us to guide others by your light. Please, Lord, be with us as this service continues. We ask that you may give us more knowledge and more wisdom than we entered, and that we may leave here with the morality of your word. Lord, we ask for forgiveness for our sins. We ask that you may forgive us for anything that we may have condemned and allow us to show our love and our faith to you. We ask for this in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, we will now break up into our respective Sabbath school classes. We'll have the lesson study in the sanctuary here. Uh, teenagers and young adults will be in the back in the choir room, and youth and young children will be down in that hallway. If you're not sure where to go, you can ask a deacon. They have a little deacon badge on their lapel, and they will direct you. We will all convene here at uh, 1020. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I pray that you all had a wonderful week since we're in a season of where people celebrate Valentine's Day, where people tend to be in their best feelings during that time. But I pray that you hold your most, utmost affection to the God, the creator of the heavens and earth. Our lesson this week is lesson number seven, which says his mercy, his mercy reaches unto the heavens. And before this lesson begin, although um, 
there was a prayer being given. Can you do one more word of prayer before we get into our lesson for this Sabbath? Father in heaven, that's one too. Thank you for allowing us to be assembled here in your sanctuary, in your tabernacle. We pray for all those who are making their way into your sanctuary. We ask that your holy angels may be in our midst. We pray you may set our hearts as we are in your presence. That our thoughts and our hearts be reach out unto you. Cleanse us of all defilements of this world. And now allow us to be receive a sour blessing. Now we pray that the Holy Spirit will also be our teacher and our guide. As we look in this lesson review, your mercy reaches unto the heavens. In Jesus' name I pray and for his sake. Amen. Amen. This week's lesson um, is a very fitting lesson considering what we had learned last week's lesson from where our brother Munjin bring out about God's judgment. That's what the emphasis was last week. But this week is focus or emphasize God's mercy. And our memory, our memory text is taken from Psalm chapter, our memory verse taken from Psalm 57, verse 9 and 10, which read, I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations, for your mercy reached unto the heavens, your truth unto the clouds. All of us are, can, can participate in this lesson. Those who want to have a, a statement, want to um, join the lesson, can just raise your hand as the lesson proceeds. Uh, you also want to add a question. And also, we'll welcome those who are listening online. If you have any comments, questions you'd like to place within the channel via whether it be YouTube or Facebook, you just could write it down. And I assure um, Brad Gian, if you do see a comment or question placed within the chat, can you just read out for us to participate in this, West, um, this lesson? Because I like to see different perspective as the lesson goes on. So I don't want to be a monologue where I only want to be speaking. I also want to experience what it says in the book of Proverbs, that iron shop with iron. So as the lesson progresses, please feel free to share your input into this lesson. And anyone who listens on Facebook or YouTube could please chat as the lesson goes on by leaving us a comment and a like. All right. In this picture in the, in the screen, you see a man scratching out, and I put a picture of the Most High God as, a, as something that we should be longing for, scratching out for. Like I mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 26, it says, and I made of one blood all nations of man to fall dwell on all the face of the earth. And I determined the times before appointed the bounds of their habitation. And that they shall seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from, from every one of us. For in him we live, we move, and have our being. So we find out in this text of scripture that God placed in human in the human race a desire to long after him, to seek after him, to desire him that we cannot find in any satisfaction that this world may present to us. Even though our best relationships cannot fill that void that God has placed in our hearts that cause us want to seek after him. And it, we find like we look at the book of Genesis chapter three, that the separation take place where man was separate from his maker. But God has not left us orphans. He has not abandoned us to our own um, destruction. God seeks after us even after we disobey him. And that desire God placed in our hearts is what makes us desire to want to be saved in the first place. If you look at the promise of God made to Adam and Eve, he said, I'll put enmity in your hearts before the serpent. So God placed enmity. This enmity drives us to seek after God. 
You may be in a, like I said earlier, you may be in a bad relationship, but there's still a void. Like he mentioned in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, that has made all things beautiful in their time and has put eternity in our hearts. And that eternity, that, that big gap of hole that God placed in our heart, caused desire to seek after him, even though we are fallen in sin. We seek his mercy, we seek his justice. If you look at the pagan world out there, all pagans believe in some kind of higher being. No, without how far they are in a deep jungle of Africa or in Amazon or the Madagascar, all of them seek after something higher than themselves. And God placed that in us to desire him. Amen? Amen. Your, mercy, your mercy reaches unto the heavens. When you look at um, Sabbath, uh, Sabbath afternoon lesson, we read that when David moved the ark to Jerusalem, the he song, for his mercy endures forever. You find that in chapter of Chronicles, chapter, chap, the first Chronicles, chapter 16, verse 34. When the ark was placed in Solomon's temple, the Levite song, for his mercy, for his mercy, love endures forever. When the divine fire consumed the Holocaust, they, they repeated, for his mercy endures forever. When Jehoshaphat went out to battle, the Levite song, for his love endures forever. When Jerusalem laid the foundation of the new temple, they sung, for his mercy endures, his mercy, love endures forever or eternal. So you can see of we frame throughout the New Old Testament that this inspired people to say, when they look at God's mercy and God's um, guidance throughout their life, there is a song of praise they con constantly be in their mouth about God's mercy and God's love. And there's a whole chapter in the book of Psalms, Psalms 139, which dwells upon a, ref a stanza, his mercy endures forever. You to create the heavens and earth, your mercy endures forever. So it's God's mercy and love that causes us want to draw out to him. It's not because of him being a, a God of oppression, a God of, a like a dictator, but we see his goodness, like I mentioned in the book of Romans, chapter 2, it's by his goodness that leads us unto repentance. So God demonstrates his goodness to us even when we are in rebellion against him, which caused us to cry out unto God. When I show Israel it was in Egypt, Experiencing hard bondage, they cry out unto God, and God sent for them a deliverer by the name of Moses. So throughout the Old Testament, you see where God's mercy and God's love towards his wayward children. What does it mean to what does it mean to me that God's love is eternal? What does it mean to me that God's love is eternal? That's, some, that's like a self-reflective thought. What does it mean internally to me that God's love is eternal? What does, the love of, what does love consist of? What benefit does it bring me? How can I respond to that love? So if you look at these questions, it says, what, it says, what does it mean that God's love is eternal? God appeared to Jeremiah we look at the book of Jeremiah, I believe it's chapter 39, where it states that, I have loved thee with everlasting love. Therefore, love and kindness I drawn thee unto me. So because of God's love being eternal, God's love is being eternal, that, co that causes him to always desire to be one, want to be with us, even though we sin against him. His love does not diminish because of our wrongdoing, nor does it re receive a uh, I would say like a climax because our obedience. His love does not waver. Like how human love waver. If you do something good, I love you more. If you do something bad, my love for you decreases. But God's love remains consistent. It always at a zenith point for you. I read a passage from the Spirit on um, Desire of Ages, which says that there's never a waking moment of your life where God is not thinking about us. There's not one moment in your life where God, where you are absent from the mind of God. And that's something to think about. Because we know that God is the creator, am I right? God's going to create everything. 
As much as he's the one who created everything, he's the one who sustained everything. Therefore, it follows by logical reasoning that if he creates everything and he sustains everything, that means that we can never be absent from his mind. For to be absent from the mind of God is to cease to exist. Every morning when, he, when we wake up, like when I wake up this morning, and there's talk in my mind when I wake up, I say, you know what? I wake up because God was thinking about me. If God was not thinking about me, I was not going. I was not going to be waking. I was not going to be getting up. If because God wake, talk is is my existence was in His mind that caused me to want to get up. And that's what that's what we are looking for in the sunshine of God's mercy and His grace. Even though we sin, we are the foul with sin. Sometimes we feel so guilty we can't even approach the throne of God. Your sin, your sin alone cannot keep you from God. It's your denial to accept his mercy and his love that will keep you from him. If you look, if you look at an example with the story of Judas, does Judas sin keep him away from Jesus? Or does Jesus keep does Judas sin cause Jesus to stay away from Judas? It was Judas and it was Judas' desire not to forsake his sin that kept him away from the Savior. Because Jesus will be the same like he did with Judas to us. He washed our feet, even though we know, he, even though he know. We will betray him. And that's the love of God I want us to dwell upon. It's eternal love for the human race. No matter what you do or don't do, can they manage God's love for us? So you cannot do works of righteousness to make him love you more, nor can you do enough bad deeds to make, you, to make him love you less. His love remains consistent all throughout your experience. Yo, um, um, brother, uh, Sister Floyd. It's interesting to me that that type of love, like mm. you said, it's always at its zenith. Right. God's love never diminishes for us, even mm. though we wrong him. We take other gods, you know, right. instead of him. But yet, we humans, many times we're seeking that type of love that only God can give right. from the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. We want that type of love from our husbands, from our wives, from our children, from our neighbor, our bestie. But they're m m humans, they're not capable of that love. The mm -hmm. more that you do for me, the nicer, the nicer that you are to me, the more that I love you back. Right. But then God, no matter what, his love stays the same. And when you ask him for forgiveness, he throws it into the sea of forgetfulness. He will not bring it back or feel some type of way about it. Right. But other human beings, they'll say, okay, I forgive you, but I can never forget. So <laughs> let's look for that true love right. that God, God can give. And don't really, you know, hurt each other thinking they should be loving you the same way that God does. Because they're just not capable of it. Right. You know, I was, re I was reading a book. It's a very powerful book. Um, one guy from Yushi Pine, they come and do a seminar in my country in the Bahamas. He wrote a book um, called The Law of Life. That's so, it was so powerful. I, I never had sort of the different perspective on the love of God when I read that book. It basically gave you a difference because um, he, he blend the law of life um, with medical terminology. And you ask, like for example, you, the, human, the human body, we all need oxygen, we all need water, we all need air, we all need these basic things, we all need love. Love is a need. You understand what I'm saying? Love is a need. If you don't believe me, you can look for example, when, when Hitler did an did a, um, experiment where they deprived the children, babies, of love of their mother, and those children end up dying. They had no human contact, no nothing. They just was remain there. They, of course, they give them like um, milk and stuff like that, but they had no human interaction. But eventually, those babies die because we need love. God created us to desire love. But in that book, he says that all those needs that we need, like oxygen, air, and those kind of things like that, does not come from us. We do not produce oxygen. We do not produce love. We don't produce, like we need food, but food does not come innately of us. We need to go outside to get what we need. And the same thing with us, all human beings need love. We cannot produce love. Love comes from God, 
and we, are, we, we, are, we are reciprocant of that love. So when you come to your husband and say, your husband loved me, your husband needs to go to the source of love, which is the God the Father, for him to love you. And that's the reason why we, um, the Advent Church does not promote or encourage. Like you see, like um, when it comes to relationship, you want to go outside your faith to marry someone who does not know God. Because that person does not rely that relies that the source of his love for his wife comes from God. The more godly you become, the more you're able to love more people. The more you grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the more you find you loving people who you couldn't even imagine you loving because the love of God is being manifested in your life. But the psalmist says this in the same lesson of um, Sabbath afternoon. The psalmist realized that they are spiritually poor. I have nothing good to offer to God. That is, they have nothing in of themselves that would recommend them before God's holy throne. Right? Understand that they are, as do all of us, need grace, God's grace. In short, they need the gospel. Now let's, now let's put that in the terms of revelation. Is there a church that says they are, they are rich, increase their goods, in need of nothing? Does such a church exist in the Bible? It says they are rich, increased with goods, and in need of nothing. But when God looks at our condition, he says we are poor, miserable, and blind. The self-delusion of the mind. Where you think you're all right, when in fact you're all wrong. In Hosea chapter 14, verse 1, it says, O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thy iniquity. Now listen, listen what Hosea says, how we shall return to the Lord when we fall into our sins. Shall we bring, shall we bring our garments of righteousness to before the Lord as a form of repentance? Now he says, Take what you words and return to the Lord, and say unto him, Take away all iniquity, and receive us graciously, so we will render the cows of our lips. So even when we come to God, we, don't, we have nothing to offer to him. When we come to him in repentance, ask for forgiveness, we have nothing to ask for him. You know, sometimes when people wrong you, they give you like a peace treaty to accept them. Maybe a gift, maybe something to, to ease the pain that they cause you. But when we come to, when we come to God, we have nothing whatsoever to present to him. If you look at um, Step to Christ, chapter 2, it says that the, the sinful human being only come to God, give him a defiled heart with Christ of the cleanse. We give Christ something that is defiled, and he gives something that is pure. His heart, his, his humanity. Like I mentioned, Revelation chapter, chapter 3, verse 14, it says, Unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things says that I men, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works are, are neither cold nor hot, and I would thou cold or hot. But because, now listen, listen what it says now. So then because thou says, now notice that there's a change. Now in chapter, in chapter 3, verse 14 and 6, 15, God gave a description of, who, of the condition of the church. But the self-deluded Laodicean does not see that, that, that the thing what God sees. He sees something so, totally different. It's that because thou says, no, they said, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spit out of my mouth. And they said, because thou says, I am rich, increase your goods, in need of nothing, and knowest not, there's the blindness, the self delusion. If you, if, you, if you ever met someone who's a narcissist, a narcissist always feels that they are right. They, they never get to a point where they think they are wrong. They always not in a right. Even though we, we bring out something that causes them to be look like they are in the wrong, Except they accept that and become feeling remorseful or sorry, they accuse you of something. And that's our condition. Unless we accept it like David did, accept our condition. Because David for a while lived like a narcissist. Self-absorbed, selfish, kill a man's wife, impregnate a man, and then live a whole year without even thinking about it. 
And that's our condition when, you, when you don't, we don't have Christ in our life. We are completely in a state of selfishness or narcissistic, narcissistic behavior. This is what Spurgeon says. I like what Spurgeon says. Spurgeon says, it is, it, is it not a sad thing that after all Christ loved, Christ loves um, to us, we should reply it, repay it with lukewarm love to him. So in exchange for God's um, um, unfair love towards us, giving us a love that is without parallel, a love that's always at his zenith, how is it that we can repay him with a lukewarm heart? A lukewarm heart is saying one thing and doing another thing. You say you love God, but your works are not him. And your works is manifested in your home life. If you are married, your works is manifested how you treat your children, how you treat your husband, or how husband treat your wife. That's how your works is manifested. It's not what you says that God look at, but what you do. But what you, what you do. Christ says in uh, March 15 verse, I think it's March 15, where he says that these people draw now to me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching the, the doctrine and commandments of men. So God does not care what you say, but what you do. A lot of people say a lot of good things. I may stand here saying all kinds of good things, but my, my life, my personal life, may be completely, completely different. So God does not look at what we say, but what we do. If you look at the example here where you find these two men, you find here a man who is in a state of self-delusion, feeling that he does not need God's self-sufficient, and you find one who is like a penitent sinner. And that's how we all should be. And that analogy is taken from the, look, the book of Luke chapter three, um, 18. We're talking about the Pharisee. The Pharisee prayed thus for himself. He said, be upon his chest, Lord, I'm, I'm thank you. I'm not like other men are, extortioners, adulterers, fornicators, all these kind of things. So he started praising himself of his own merits. And God says, this, and God says to the publican who says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. He says, that man went to his house justified. That man went to his house having a peace of God in his mind. While the one who is proud, who is arrogant, self-sufficient, God does not recognize him. Our estimate of Christ is the best gauge of our spiritual condition. As a thermometer rise in proportion due to increased warmth of the air, so does our estimate of Christ rise as spiritual life increases in vigor and fervency. Tell me what you think of Jesus, and I'll tell you what you ought to think of yourself. Christ is all to us, yea, more than all, when we are truly sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. When pride of self is filled up the, th the soul, there is little room for Jesus. But when Jesus is fully loved, self is the, th the subdued and sin driven out of the throne. If we think little of our Lord Jesus, we have very great cause to account ourselves freshly blind, naked and poor, and miserable. The rebel despises his lawful sovereign, but the favorite crude um, courtier is enthusiastic in his prayers. Christ crucified is a reveal of many hearts, the touch to him by which the true gold and the confident male is discerned. His very name is like refined fire and a full of soap. False professors cannot endure it but true believers from their end. We are grown in grace when we grow in the knowledge of our Lord and our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Let everything else be done and let Christ fit up the task space of our soul. Then, only then, we are rising out of the vanity of our flesh into a real life of God. It's, a, it's an extract taken from Charles Persian's sermon, a, lady, um, a song among, among the ladies. And what I get from that is that when we truly love Christ, like I mentioned, desire, um, I think it's the Christ, the chapter 5, consecration. It says our sweetest thought will be of him. When we are truly converted, have that Christ life living in us. Our sweetest thought will be of him. And I remember like one day when I spent a whole day um, doing a meditation because I was um, talking with one of my um, then girlfriend at the time, we spent a whole day just talking about or doing like a series of talk on on the, um, the book Set the Christ, and 
spend so much time talking about Christ, it causes us to want to spend more time in prayer. Want to spend more time in want to get to know this God. And that's the reason why if you look at the life of Christ, he spent so much time in prayer. Sometimes he spent whole nights praying to his Father. That's how you cultivate a desire for God, by spending time with him. And if those of us who don't spend that time to get to know the Father, how can you know his voice? How can you know when he's speaking to you? Sometimes God speaks to you when you're near the job. Someone trying to backstab you, someone trying to talk bad about you. And God sometimes forewarns you by speaking to you, by speaking to your conscience. But if you don't, know, if you don't spend time to recognize his voice, how would you um, say which one is God's voice or which one is not God's voice? So I encourage each one, each one of us to spend time trying to get to know the voice of the Father. On Sunday's lesson, they're talking about his mercy and God forever. We talk about um, the whole chapter is dedicated. Um, we're given like a stanza of God's mercy and God's love. Um, sums of God's people to praise the Lord for his mercy as revealed in creation. And Israel in history, mercy conveys God's goodness and loyalty to his creation and his covenant with Israel. Like I mentioned earlier that we know that the person who created everything was Jesus Christ. If you look at the Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 where it says, Bereshit bara Elohim. That word Elohim is a compound word. Like you have, for example, um, him is like an S for the Hebrew. Like you have cherub, that's angel, that's one angel. And you have cherubim, that's a, a, a multitude of angels. So when it says El, that's God, Lohim, that's plurality within the Godhead. So within the Godhead, the creation work take place within a, within a unit of a family. It was not God isolated when he created everything. That we really desire, they just, um, um, I think it's page 19, paragraph 2, where it says, God's thought was made audible. Speaking of Jesus. So Jesus carried out the work of creation through the Father, on behalf of the Father. So there was in a unity among the God when he created this world. And when God created the human race, he established a family unit. He established um, Adam and Eve. Eventually, Adam and Eve will have children, and they'll go against having a family unit. And the family unit was there to illustrate God's um, character, God's um, uh, mercy. Because even when you see, like, uh, when you look at the, the human race, you see, um, like, when, when it comes to Abraham, when Lord separated himself from Abraham, Abraham showed humility by allowing the Lord to choose a better part of the land which to, which to choose. So God wants us to incorporate his characteristics, his mercy, his love, and his steadfast love for one another, uh, incorporate it am among one another. There's a, one interesting fact I learned when I was putting this presentation together. It says there are more than stars in the universe than grains of sand or the beaches on earth. It says there are more stars in the universe than all the beaches on the earth. Imagine how much stars there must be. It says that's at least billions or trillions of, of grain of sand. And the Bible says this about our God. He telleth the number of stars. He, call, he calleth them all by their names. Can you imagine that? There are trillions upon billions of, of stars, but God knows each of their names. And the most humbling thing about it is this. When, God was, when Jesus speaks in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, your very hair on your head is numbered. So God, who has all this activity going on in the cosmos, he is mindful of us. That's the reason why the Psalm David says in Psalm chapter 8, he says, Lord, when I consider the moon, the stars, which, do, which you have ordained, what is man that you even are mindful of him? Why, is he, why does man even come to your, your, your mind? You have these vast galaxies. If you look at, the, if you look at um, 
If you look through the um, National Geographic, sometimes they give a, a how big and how large the universe is. And yet, God is mindful of us. Even to a point where he says, for thou visit us. I, <laughs> when I first read that um, being a new Christian, I couldn't believe that. I couldn't believe that God would Special, special when I look at National Geographic, I, I used to love watching National Geographic, look at the cosmos, the kind of different galaxies, and I see how big this world is, and then this book going to tell me that the God of the universe visit this planet, not only visit the planet, but take the part of himself, a human nature, my nature. He walked with me, he talked with me. Can you imagine that God sleeping in the same bed where you sleeping at? That's what that's the experience of the disciples. The disciples saw Jesus sleeping with them. And when it when they dawned upon their consciousness that this was God in the flesh. And that's something that's very humbling to, for, for me. That God will come down out of all those activities that are taking place in the, in, the, in the heavens. He's humble enough to come see and visit his creation. It says, Great is our Lord and great power. His understanding is infinite. And what I want us to get from this is this. If God is mindful of the vast creation, he's mindful of even of a bird that fell to the ground that's not past notice. How then are we magnifying our problems? Because sometimes we get depressed because of our problems. We lose, um, we lose sleepless nights because of our anxieties and our problems. But if God who is so powerful, so big, so mighty, can take care of the whole universe, can he not take care of us? Do you, have, do you have a reason to be fearful? Do you have a reason to have a fearful heart when God could take care of the universe? When we were sleeping this morning or last night, when you were sleeping, do you consciously say to yourself, me get up? While you were sleeping, God himself sustained you. And God himself says, wake up. Because you could put a long clock in all kinds of graves, and no, no one will get up from those graves. And left the life giver gives you life. Wow. I don't get to the crux of our lesson, which I really want to focus and emphasize on. It says, create in me a clean heart. Now, let me ask this question since I've been doing a lot of talking. What does the psalmist appeal, what does, why does the psalmist appeal to God's mercy? This one's getting to a class. I've been doing a lot of talking. Why does the psalmist appeal to God's mercy? Anyone? It says, King David poured out his heart before the Lord, asking for the forgiveness of his sins during the spiritual darkest moments in his life. Forgiveness is God's extraordinary gift of grace, the result of multitude of tender mercies. King David appealed to God to deal with him, not according to what he, what he appealed to him, not in accordance with what his sin deserves. And the, the question is, why does the psalmist appeal to God's mercy? Yeah. Now, uh, Psalm 91, uh, I mean Psalm 51, was written by David after he committed that grievous sin right. uh, against Bath Bathsheba and also killing Uriah, mm -hmm. the husband. And uh, David pronounced judgment against himself right. that that man should die when he was confronted by Nathan the prophet. So out of this, he realized that without God's mercy, without God's forgiveness, mm. he will die because of his sin. So he was longing for God's uh, uh, forgiveness so that he will be like restored to his previous uh, condition. Because without God's mercy, he ought to die. Right. Sister Floyd? 
He also, David also realized that the heart of men, including his, is utterly wicked. Mm -hmm. So without God creating a clean and pure heart inside of him and renew his steadfast love, there's no way that he can be a better man. He cannot walk the right way with God with the same wicked heart. So he needed God to intervene and change his heart. Amen. But I want to ask him, dude, I want to ask him our question in light of that. But notice what like, Brad Bungo was bringing out. David pronounced judgment upon himself. That man ought to die. But listen to how narcissistic that sound. After he learned that Nathan knew he was the man. He says, he says, have mercy upon me. But if you look at it from his point of view, he says, judgment belongs to that man shall die. When it comes to him, he seeks mercy. You see how we are as human beings? We have wicked hearts. If, if David knew that was a different person who did that, that person was going to die. And that's the reason why we have to be thankful for God's mercy. Amen? Because if God treat like, um, I think it was on uh, Monday's Tuesday lesson, if God marks sin or God marks iniquity, where would we be? Brother David. Yeah, it's interesting. God's mercy and obviously people that need mercy are people in trouble. Right. When we're in trouble, we want mercy. <laughs> <laughs> when we're in a court of law, we want mercy. So obviously David and all of us are in trouble because of sin. But the right. point I'm getting at is, don't you think that sometimes mercy can be abused? Let's talk about that. Because mm -hmm. it's good to talk about mercy, and we know it exists. I won't get to that. I, won't I get take to that. it from, for concrete. It's in concrete. God yeah. is merciful. However, is there such a thing as abuse of mercy? Yeah, that's a good question, I think, to think We about. won't get into that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we won't get into that. I'm trying to jump the gun. Oh, also, one more question, corollary to that, is not only is is mercy, can it be abused? But the other question that goes with it is, even though mercy does is forever, is mercy, what does that mean, forever? Because you see, if I'm going to sin forever, definitely right. I need mercy forever. You understand my point? Right. That's my point. Does, right. does mercy eventually have a consummation where mercy is done? Because I know the angels don't need mercy. Mm -hmm. The angels didn't fall. They don't need mercy. Okay. They don't ask for mercy, nor do they need mercy. That's an interesting thought. Mm -hmm. So that's my question. What happens to mercy in the future when everything is done? In other words, it's something to think about. I think Brad Williams has something to say. Brad Williams. Brad Williams. Brad I, put, I, put the, I put him on the spotlight. Based on what his question was, he says that, can we abuse mercy? Yeah, I believe that we do that every day, sir. Um, just the fact that we're living alive and um, we wake up uh, in the sinful world, but we sometimes, or most of, more often than not, we give in to the temptations of the day, of this, this present world. And so we are ever dependent on God's mercy, but we're also looking, looking at it as it's, it's, um, um, it's a bottomless pit that we can always go back to it and, 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 and receive right. of it as if it's just, Unending, mm -hmm. you see, and and that's the that's the fallacy and that's the um, um, uh, misconception that we have. And, um, and yes, it's it's one of the uh, conditions that we actually live in in this current age. Amen. But I also want to add this: although God's mercy can never run out, relative to God, God's mercy can never run out. You cannot, you can never exhaust God's mercy. But we must understand that we are creatures of habit, right? We are creatures of habit. Let me, let me illustrate this. I, if, you, if you look at Red chapter 16, talk about the seven last plagues, it says God poured out his, mer his judgment without mercy, right? For the first time in human race, God going to pour his judgment without mercy. No, not an inch of mercy is tied into his judgment. The Bible says these people cursed out God because of it, because of the plagues, for it was great. The Bible says they blasphemed the name of God and would not repent to give him glory. So, because we are creatures of habit, sometimes we get to a point where 
like the Bible says, our corners become sealed with a hot iron. We are so, we are so um, steep in our ways that we cannot be moved. You understand what I'm saying? God's mercy is not run out, but it's just that we come to a point where his mercy cannot reach us. The door is still knocking, but we cannot hear, we cannot hear the knock on the, on the door. Our ears drum become numb to the voice of the Holy Spirit. The, if you look um, um, Tough Among Blessings, page 19. I mean, Tough, tough Among Blessings, chapter, uh, page 91. It says that we could come to a point where God's mercy can never reach us no more. It's not that God's mercy run out, but we come to a point where we cannot hear the voice of God. God speaking to us, we cannot hear his voice. That sounds like you're saying, and my question is, does mercy have a purpose? Yes. Because, in other words, God extends mercy, but uh, if I understand some people's understanding of mercy is God is so merciful that everyone's going to be saved. Everyone. Mm -hmm. See, there's that understanding of mercy. No. no That's no, no, my no, question. No, no, no. <laughs> because, like I, like I mentioned about, um, now, Jesus used a lot of examples of, of, of like, like um, fruits and stuff like that to illustrate, to give a point. Like, for example, when a fruit reaches a point of ripeness, when, when fruit gets ripe, we, 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 turn, we call that harvest in time. It's time for the harvest that fruit to eat it. The Bible uses the same knowledge we come to human beings. We come to a point of ripeness. We, we get to a point where we cannot change. We don't, we don't want to change. We become established in our ways. So mercy is, a, is given to us for cause to change, but we are creatures of habit, come to a point where we become so fixed. The Bible says that um, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 16, it says, trust in thy sickle to reap, for the harvest of earth is ripe. That means not, it comes to a point where people make the decision, I'm going to follow Satan, and I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to do this. You ever meet people like this? I born a Catholic or a dog Catholic. They come to a point where their mind is fixed. They will not change. No matter what you say, what you do. So God have to, so God, so God have to, um, so since God is a God of um, free will, he must accept your decision of not accepting his mercy and move on. But Brad, you want to say something? No, it's, it's interesting that Sounds like you're saying that mercy is extended to everyone, but sometimes we'll get to the point where we're, the Bible uses this verse, let him alone, says the Lord right. about Ephraim, because he's beholden to his idols, meaning there is something else that has their attention greater than right. God. It's not that people don't necessarily want mercy, but see, I believe that there has to be an action part of mercy that is there. And I think sometimes we think of mercy as being something static, you know, oh, there's mercy. But I think that it demands a response because that mercy is extended because of the blood shed on Calvary while yeah. we have mercy. And, and so unless we see that as the reason why I don't want to keep sinning, because every time I do, it requires what? The blood of Christ on the shed on Calvary every single time. I think yeah. God desires us to look at that and go, you know what? I don't want to be holding to my idols anymore. <laughs> Maybe that's something that we have to discuss. Okay, Brad, Bungai, what's the floor? I think it's good to always bring the lesson back to us mm. in our daily lives, how it applies to us in our lives. So with the Godhead, you see that unity. Mm. The Godhead together, all three were there in part of creation. The same way he put us into families so that the husband and the wife will you unite together and become one flesh, right. as the Bible say, right. and raise the children in the way of the Lord right. and worship God together and obey him together as a family unit. Mm -hmm. The same way when the disciples asked Jesus Christ, what is the greatest commandment? Mm -hmm. He said, first and foremost, to love God right. with all of your mind, all of your heart strength, okay, with everything that's in you. And the second is like the first love one another. Mm -hmm. And that's how the world will know that he has sent us. 
Right. So whether here in the church, in our neighborhood, at work, wherever we are, that same mercy, we must not abuse it, keep mm. hurting the person's feelings, and oh, I apologize, or not even apologize, and expect you know, the same level of friendship, caring, and so on. Right. So we need to reflect the mercy of God and the love of Christ, Amen. and make sure that you know we're um, loving one another the way that we're supposed to, and have the mercy for one another. Okay, I want to move on to a lesson, but you all make some very good points. But I want to read this portion. It says, divine forgiveness involved more than a legal proclamation of innocence. It produced a profound change that reached the most inmost part of the human self. It brings about a new creation. Now, we're going to talk about that later on as we um, bring this lesson to a close. It says in the, in the part of the, um, the paragraph, only God can produce a radical a radical and lasting change in a repentant person's heart. Okay. Even, like what um, David was talking about, even the desire to do good comes from God. Repentance comes from Jesus Christ. You can't wake up one day and say, I want to repent. The Bible says, he should send, forgive, he should, he should, he should give us a heart repentance. God give you the heart repentance. So without the Holy Spirit working your heart, you can't even desire to seek God after God. It's the Holy Spirit working your heart that causes you one desire to seek after God. Wow, time going fast. <laughs> but anyway, but let me close with this thought because I, I didn't want to get to the um, to a closing part, but nevertheless. Um, forgiveness comes with a desire to want change. And God only will give you, for, uh, God will give you power to make that change. So I want to close with this thought. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen from thy iniquity. Take what you words and return to the Lord, and say unto him, take away all iniquity, receive us graciously, so we will render the cows of our lips. I want to thank you for participating in the lesson. Um, truly being a very powerful lesson. I wish I could have get to the very climax I want to get into, but um, maybe next time we could do that. Can you please bow, let's pray. Father and everyone, I just want to thank you for this uh, very powerful lesson. We just want to thank you for being a God of mercy and God of compassion. We thank you for allowing us to ex for extend mercy to us and uh, give us a period of, pro pro of probation that we may get our life together. Forgive me for um, going... Um, above my time. I pray that you will continue to be with the service. Bless us with your spirit. Let each of us receive a solid blessing. It's my prayer. In Christ, I pray for us. Say, amen. We will now collect the Sabbath school offerings. May the deacons please come forward. Inspire heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for bringing us here today. We ask, Lord, that as we collect your offering today, that you please bless it and multiply it. Let it be used for your purposes, Lord. Let it be used for the advancement of your service and allow us to be good stewards of your money, Lord. We ask all these things in your name we pray. Amen.
Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Uh, our mission story this morning uh, is from Nepal. Happy Childless Widow. Her name is Ratnamaya. Ratnamaya got married in Nepal when she was 13 years old. Many years passed and she did not have a child. Towns people called her unkind names. Friends and relatives looked down on her as cursed. Her husband blamed her and drank heavily. Ratnamaya felt very sad. She wanted more than anything in the world to have a child. She tried everything that she could to get pregnant, but nothing helped. When it seemed the life couldn't get worse, her husband sudden, suddenly died. Ratnamaya's sadness multiplied. Now she had to live with the double pain of being childless and a widow. She felt so lonely. She saw other people living happily with children and grandchildren. Then the COVID-19 pandemic struck and she was stuck in lockdown for months. She gradually lost her will to live. It was then that a nephew stopped by her small house Lockdown restrictions were easing, and he invited her to visit his church. Come to my church, he said. You will hear many new things, and you can, lost, and you can also get a gift. The church was distributing rice and blankets to needy people during the pandemic. Ratnamaya decided to go. The Sabbath worship service surprised her. She had been raised in a non-Christian religion and it was the first time that she had observed a Christian program. She was especially drawn to the hymns, and she felt peace in her heart as she listened to people sing about Jesus. Churchgoers greeted Ratnamaya and spoke with her. She was astonished that no one called her names or looked down on her. No one said that she was to blame for being a childless widow. Instead, Everyone spoke kindly and lovingly to her. After the Sabbath, several women from the church began to visit Ratnamaya at her home. They taught her the Bible and prayed with her. Ratnamaya started to go to church every Sabbath. She felt, very, uh, she felt good every time she went to church and spoke with people at church. She was especially happy to learn that Jesus Love her very much. She stopped feeling lonely and sad. In Jesus, she found a joy that had been missing her whole life. She felt like the happiest person in the world. The Lord has given me his peace in my heart, she said. I always be thankful to God for his love and for everything that he has done in my life. Today, Ratnamaya is 65 years old and still growing in church and in her Christian faith. She never went to school, so she cannot read or write. But she is studying the Bible with a woman from church and by listening to a radio podcast produced by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I want to grow in the Lord even more, so I ask everyone to pray for me. She said, one of Ratnamaya's favorite Bible verses in Philippians 4.4, where Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. I don't have husband nor children, but I never feel lonely because I can rejoice in my Lord and Savior. She said, my Lord is always with me, and he loves me more than anything. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help establish an elementary school where children can learn to read and write in Nepal. Thank you for planning a generous 13th Sabbath offering on March 30th. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, happy Sabbath, church.
embrace the power of sin and darkness whose love and mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphans a son and daughter? The King of Glory, the King of Glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King above all kings Yeah, this is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me worthy is the lamb who was slain the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy 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 this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down your life that I would be set free I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the lamb, isn't he? Amen. 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 Uh, you know, darling, we have a ministry moment this morning. Yes. And we're going to talk about health. And, uh, of course. And disasters if you don't have good health. <laughs> yes. Uh, two things. First of all, we want you to, to remind you of our disaster response warehouse uh, training and donations and operations. 
Now, um, we have arranged a special deal uh, for those who would like to be trained to uh, have housing at an extremely discounted rate. Yes. Uh, that's only $25 per night. And the hotels over there are anywhere from two to 300 a night. And so uh, at Forest Lake Academy, anyone that wants to be trained in disaster response you can come and we uh, will train you. Now, dear, we're gonna we're gonna be part of that, aren't we? You, we are. you and I. <laughs> I'm gonna be assisting in the forklift training, and so I've been taking the course, and so I am uh, the new warehouse manager for the Florida Conference. So if a disaster hits, I'm praying that the Lord will keep them away as long as possible, <laughs> and then. Um, we want you to know that we love Pompano and each individual here, and we just want you to come if you have the opportunity. A few people have reached out to us. This is an opportunity to get trained and to be certified. Now, there's some people that were trained before, right? right. Last time, and uh, at uh, Port 